Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm Bryony Harris and I work in the beef and lamb team at HGB. So I'll quickly run through some housekeeping before we start this evening. So the webinar is expected to run from 7 until 8pm tonight. If you drop out at any point, the webinar will be recorded and a recording will be sent round to everyone who has pre-registered for this webinar. It will also be available on YouTube afterwards on the HGB Beef and Lamb YouTube channel. At the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up, so please do fill this in as it helps us make sure we're providing the right webinars and events for you. Roaster points are available for tonight's webinar. If you're registered with Rosa and you didn't include your membership number when you signed up, you can pop it into the chat box at any point during the evening tonight and we will sort those points out for you. The final thing is that all attendees will be muted throughout the webinar. To ask a question, you will need to go to your toolbar on your screen and click on the arrow. You should then get the option to type in your question in the question box as shown on the screen here. All of your questions will be answered anonymously and we will try our best to answer them throughout, so please do send them in. If anyone has any burning questions, please pop them in now and we will ask our speakers. But So that's great. So pleased to welcome Sam and Bridget for tonight's webinar. Sam, Bridget, over to you. Well, thank you very much. So I'm Sam Boone, I'm the manager of Signet and HGB breeding specialist, and I'm going to be presenting tonight. And lucky to have Bridget here, who's uh, uh, really running and managing the project, doing all the hard work. And uh, Bridget, do you want to introduce yourself and explain what you're up to this evening? I'm the um, Ram Compare project coordinator. I've been busy collecting lots of Ram nominations the last few last few weeks. I'm just here as background support mostly for Sam tonight, just in case anything goes wrong with sound quality or anything like that. And we'll be helping with fielding questions at the end of the session. So I, I'm going to mute and I will hand over to you, Sam. Superb. Thank you very much, Bridget. Right. Let's do a show of the screen, see if we've got this working. Right. Bryony, can we see can you see the screen okay? That's perfect. Thanks, Sam. Marvellous. Okay. Well, very good evening, folks. I think we've got a, a record number for a RAM compare uh, presentation this evening, although I noticed we can handle up to a thousand on the software, so feel free to, to tell your friends to come and join us. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the project. It's our commercial progeny test for terminal sires. And uh, we're going to talk just a reminder of, of what RAM Compare is about, uh, what we're hoping to achieve through the project. I'm going to talk about the new approach to analysing the data. There's been a really big change this year in the way that we analyse and present the data, so we'll talk about that. A bit about results for 2022-23 LAM crop, um, a bit about the new economic index, and then most of all, how both commercial RAM buyers and pedigree breeders can really get the most out of the RAM Compare project. So what is RAM Compare? Uh, essentially, it's a, a progeny test. So we take a range of terminal sire RAMs from Signet recorded flocks. Uh, we purchase RAMs for natural service mating. And we also have artificial insemination with semen that's been nominated to the project. And uh, from that, we obviously have a strict quarantine in place and they're put to uh, a range of, of views on specific farms and we collect information at lambing time. Uh, we collect information on eight week weights and uh, then again, lambs are, are scanned using ultrasound scanning to measure muscle and back fat. And all those things you can actually do on uh, within our performance recorded um, flocks with Signet. But the additional part that we can do with uh, RAM Compare is collecting the abattoir data at the end. So all of that data is collected and then we analyse it using a standard statistical analysis to produce breeding values for individual traits. And these are some of the breeding values that are available. And then also pulling those breeding values together to produce a, an overall breeding index. So this is the information that's produced as part of the RAM Compare project. 
And none of it would be possible if it wasn't for our funders and supporters and collaborators in this project. So we're very grateful to have levy funding that actually enables this project to run. We've got great technical support through SIUC, data coming through from the abattoirs who play a massive role within this project. And then we have health data, uh, uh, software professionals that are all throwing their weight behind the project. Having said all of that, none of it would happen without these folk. So we've got farms in uh, up in Yorkshire, uh, Northumberland, Rutland, Hampshire, Leicestershire, Cornwall, Midlothian up in Scotland, uh, and the two farms in Paris here. Uh, and I won't be name checking everyone, but we've got a number of farms that are providing us with some fantastic data. And I know they're not doing it for the money, they're doing it because of their interest in the project, the value that it gives back to industry. And uh, every time I mention a farm, I should probably use the word and family in both cases because of the extra support and uh, our gratitude for their help with that. So a number of fantastic farms that are actively collecting data for this project going above and beyond. So the RAM compare data to date, we've collected about 38,500 uh, records uh, for individual lambs and we've tested about 400 different sires. You might remember at the start of the project, my sort of aim was to get well 25, 30 lambs per sire. You can see that actually we're closer to about 90 lambs per sire. And that's in part because of repeat use of rams over time. It's partly because of the farms saying, well, it's okay. We don't just put 40 ewes to this ram. We'll put 60, we'll put 73. You can have all the data uh, for your project. And that's given extra strength in terms of the comparison, particularly comparisons uh, across years. So this is a really large and significant data set. You can see that the breeds that have been involved, so a whole range of breeds, uh, putting forward rams for test and we're also getting data from additional sources so um, if you think of um, you know the dorsets for example uh, it might only be a, a small slither of, of this particular pie but actually through other work that we're doing with them we've got a, a number of extra dorset records that have come through and been analyzed because of the infrastructure that we've set up with the ram compare project that means we can slot additional data in and so there's more to come from that uh, later in the presentation our aims as part of ram compare was to see first of all could we produce estimated breeding values uh, from the abattoir data and how heritable um, were these individual traits and, and how did the abattoir traits relate to the things that we already measure on farm Secondly, it was to compare the performance of rams under commercial conditions to see if those genetic differences that we've talked about are expressed on predominantly forage based uh, farms run commercially and also to look at what value this extra data provides to the analysis. And thirdly, it was to give another example of the, the commercial benefits of using high genetic merit performance rams. And in previous presentations, I've probably focused on that a bit more than I will tonight. Although there's a number of case studies that Laura Isles has put up onto the, uh, the Ram Compare website, talking about the impact of high index rams on these individual farms. And you can have a read and, and, and have a look at that yourselves tonight. So those were our original aims, and those were not just met, they were exceeded. We, we've done a fantastic job with those. Uh, with the help of our partners. But the sort of the next phase of the project has been very much about widening the impact of the project, uh, making the data more accessible, ensuring that it's as relevant uh, uh, as it can be to both pedigree breeders and to commercial farmers. So we've put in some uh, new ways of handling the data and making it available to, to widen its impact. And then I suppose secondly, following on from that, is encouraging ram breeders to actually trust and use the new data within their breeding programs because over time uh, this might we might reach a situation where we have even more focus on these traits and less focus on the proxy traits that we've had for the last uh, two or three decades so perhaps talking less about scanway tbv when actually what we're interested in is days to slaughter and we now have a breeding value for days to slaughter so some new aspirations as part of the project. 
So we've gone from this scenario whereby we're running our national terminal sire evaluation, our mixed breed uh, genetic evaluation uh, for, for uh, RAM producers, and then a sort of a standalone analysis for RAM compare, which was quite useful because we could use one to validate the other and then look at how, when they're analysed independently, they relate one to another. But we've moved beyond that. And this year, we will we have a single analysis. We use the National Terminal SAR Evaluation. We use the pedigree and the infrastructure from that to analyze um, our abattoir traits. And they are standalone traits within the analysis at the moment. Um, we don't have correlations fitted between traits where you the, there is one that will exist and can logically be fitted in the future. It's a starting point. So they sit there as an independent um, part within this, this multi-breed analysis. The advantages of this approach is that you can have monthly updates. So rather than me sitting here as I am at the moment talking about data from, in many cases, that was collected eight or nine months ago, um, as data comes in, uh, as it now does from many of my Paul Dorset breeders, for example, it goes in each month and those breeding values can be updated. And that might mean there's a little bit more movement in the breeding values over time for new rams that are coming through but it does mean that you get much faster feedback in terms of the performance on rams uh, it's making better use of the pedigree so if we find a ram of interest we can now go back and see what breeding values his sire or his mother or his progeny uh, will have for that particular trait the data is visible and it's easily accessible in one place uh, so rather than having a printed book to go looking for and, and waiting for that to come out, you can now effectively get the data online. Uh, and it should be easier to target rams. So when I'm talking to, uh, for example, some of my meat link breeders about which rams they want to put forward, I can now make better recommendations about animals that perhaps we don't know as much about that we'd like to get some more information on. So quite a big step forward. So it's really, a it's a gradual change, but it's a change from being a, a research focused project where we learn lots of new information about the traits themselves to being a, one with great industry application and moving from a, a subset of RAMs that we were assessing to actually moving to a service where we can, over time, find the best animals within a breed for these particular attributes. The other thing it means is really moving away from these um, annual mixed breed reports that you can see that we would have produced last year um, because within uh, a month of them being produced, they're out of date because there'll be new information coming in. So moving from paper based reports uh, to electronic online reports, and I'll show you how those can be generated. And also moving away a little bit from the which breed is top and how do the breeds compare with each other and moving a little bit more to, I know about my breed, which are the animals within that breed that are gonna give me the best genetics for traits like carcass weight or, or days to slaughter. Because at the end of the day, when you head off to buy a ram, generally you have a good idea of the breed that you're interested in and where you need help is to find the best genetics within that breed. So a bit of a recap, really. These are the breeding values that are available. Uh, to ram buyers when they head into the industry to go to go shopping for rams, traits influencing ease of birth, such as birth weight and lambing ease, traits influencing growth. And then you've actually got three different ways now of assessing carcass traits, be it the data through the ultrasound scanning service uh, run with freelancers and Signet staff, but also with Innovis doing a lot of our ultrasound scanning. And that data is widely, widely available on a lot of Signet recorded animals. You've got data coming from the CT unit, but that tends to be a subset of those animals and their relatives that have gone through the, the CT scanner. And now you can see where the abattoir data slots into our portfolio of, of breeding values. And that's similar to CT in a way, because at this current moment of time, again, some animals will be well recorded for those attributes but large numbers won't have that much data at this moment in time. And we can talk about how that, that may change over time. And of course, I should also mention that we do assess maternal traits 
in our terminal sires. If I was talking to my pole Dorset and Dorset Horn group, then actually maternal ability, genetics of milk production, and uh, litter size, an indicator of prolificacy, would be right at the forefront uh, of their breeding programme, where a selection for female traits is uh, just as important as the work they do for growth and carcass attributes. So those are the traits that are available to us. In terms of the results published for the coming year, we'll talk about tables uh, for the four individual EBVs. And the data that I'm going to show here has been converted back onto a, uh, a mixed breed basis so that we can compare like with like. Obviously, when it goes on to the internet, then we're actually reporting off a breed specific base. And that's quite important. So if I see a Charolais uh, with a figure of five and a Suffolk with a figure of four, on the internet, then we're back to reporting on breed specific basis at this moment in time. And then I'll talk about the new land value as well. And although we haven't produced a glossy booklet with lots of tables in it, we have produced a new publication that explains how we handle carcass data and how we can make the best decisions when selecting animals for carcass attributes. So those are available at uh, certainly at the regional NSA events this year available from Signet, and we'll get those out to Signet clients shortly as well. So quite a lot of new information in that publication. So the first table, uh, we'll start with the carcass weight. So these are the rams uh, ranked according to carcass weight of the uh, 90 or so rams uh, that were tested this year. Um, you can see a range of different breeds represented uh, amongst them. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of Suffolks in at that top list. We've got a homebred ram uh, up at Sockland Farm um, that's uh, sitting really quite high within the rankings. Uh, just above him is our reference ram for the year. And actually, I was speaking to Arnold Park by pure coincidence uh, this morning. Um, and so telling him that actually his Drinkston uh, ram, although it's quite old genetics these days, that's a 13-year-old ram, but he performed really well for CT attributes. Um, and, and that's very much seen uh, in terms of, of his overall performance in terms of carcass weight. But sitting above them this year, we've actually got three Charolais that have performed really well uh, on the, the progeny test this year. And uh, you know, just as a very quick sort of mini study here, I say Laura's written up quite a bit about case studies from individual farms, but this is a, a small chart just showing carcass weight EBV for sires carcass weight that was actually achieved on farm and you can see this lad up here at the top producing carcass weights a kilo a kilo and a half heavier uh, at a, a similar age in many cases um, to, to some of these other lower ranking rams on the farm so that's a real tangible difference that's not a few grams here and there that's a big difference in carcass weights much of which can be directly attributed to that ram's genetics um, so that's a little bit about the performance uh, down at Dewpath. We've got photos there from the, the open day that we actually held down there last year. So these are some of the, the high performing rams for carcass weight. If we have a look at carcass conformation, again, we've got uh, some of those heavily muscled breeds sitting relatively high within the rankings. You can see that our animals that were one and two for carcass weight are also two and three for confirmation. So those are genetics that are bringing us both the weight and the confirmation um, together within the rankings. Right at the top, we've got a, a blue Texel from Sue and Aubrey Andrews at Mizzardin, and uh, that was used with, with Duncan. And uh, on Duncan's particular farm, actually for the overall flock average, he's got 97% E's, U's and R's. He's not necessarily chasing E's, but he doesn't want any O's and P's within the group. And the flock average there typically is about 18% E's and U's uh, from his flock, um, which uh, 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 that's mules. Uh, sorry, forgive me, Duncan. That's Clins uh, within his flock. But you can see that particular ram was giving about 45% E's and U's. So this isn't necessarily about chasing E's. But if you're looking for genetics that will actually move away from high proportions of, of O's and P's in the flock, we can readily identify genetics that will, will do that job. So 
that is the, the current ranking in terms of uh, carcass confirmation. Uh, again, we've got another blue text on import here um, that performed uh, very well for both attributes as well uh, on both of those. If we uh, click on to uh, fat class, we can see that the leaner end uh, of the genetics uh, within this year's progeny test, uh, and certainly if you're getting a few too many uh, overfat lambs or lambs that are going, uh, uh, being overfinished at a relatively light weight, then using leaner genetics is one way of, of tailoring those and avoiding uh, that particular issue. And you can see that the number of texels tended to have been at the leaner end. Uh, within this year's um, production of results. And in terms of days to slaughter, this was the fourth bit of the jigsaw. Uh, again, this is where we tend to see uh, a large number of both Hampshires and Suffolks uh, dominating in terms of days to slaughter. And again, that would be um, the case this year. A couple of new Suffolks um, on this listing from the earlier chart where lambs were going away really fast. You've got several Hampshires uh, within that, that top five, including the, the lad from Thorbeck uh, at the top. He was used down in Hampshire. That was a May lambing system um, that had the challenges that many of you had this year in terms of drought. Um, and it was less about little grass and at some points it was about no grass. Um, so the overall average this year was lambs were taking about 270 days, 274 days to finish and that lamb's progeny on average were away a good 12 days earlier and so that represents lambs that aren't eating grass that are away uh, and that are finished and, and off the farm so there's some really good information there days to slaughter tends to correlate quite closely with our scanway tbvs so that's all well and good but how do we actually rank these animals according to their their overall genetic worth uh, and indeed their economic worth in the past, we've had a breeding value that's been looking at carcass value. So it's taken into account carcass weight, uh, confirmation and fat class. And it's been aspiration of the project to build in days to slaughter to actually reward that. And not just to weight it within the index, but actually to put a financial value on each of those attributes so that we can have an index that's expressed in economic terms. And that's this sub-index that we're referring to as, as lamb value. So I just want to talk a little bit about how that's put together. Um, relatively easy to put a value on carcass weight. Uh, we know what the, the value uh, of lamb is per kilo. Um, likewise, for confirmation and fat class, it's relatively straightforward uh, to look at the way that the value of the carcass changes as you move across the grid uh, and convert that back into uh, to convert the breeding values back into economic terms. The more challenging one is days to slaughter. It's notoriously hard to, to value. Um, before I move on to that, the bit that I forgot to say is that uh, for the last 20 years or so, I've been saying to people, to know what you're going to get in the progeny, you have to halve the value of the RAM. Uh, and so to save saying that, we've halved the value. So this is all about expression at the LAM level rather than telling you about the value of the ram and then saying halve it to get to the progeny. So this is about financial value at the lamb level and very grateful to Abby up at SIUC and Samir for their guidance on this and a wider team of, of genetic experts that actually supported us on this project uh, within Mike Coffey's eGenes team. So just back to the value of days to slaughter, this is, is how we've looked at it. So there's a direct benefit, and that's namely in terms of forage and feed that's saved. Um, it's very easy to think that that feed that's saved during the summer has a very low value, there's lots of grass available. But actually what you're doing in, in saving forage at that time is you're leaving, if you're conserving it well, that you've got grass for overwintering, uh, you've got lower um, feed bills associated with either finishing off other store lambs, lambs left over at the end of the season, or indeed uh, needing to bring in extra to feed and forage um, for, for use to get them through the winter. So don't just think about the, the cost of the summer grass, but have a think about the impact across the farm. Um, also a small reduction in vet med, probably a, you know, a treatment um, 
depending on the, the time scale. So you can easily get to 15 or 20 pence a lamb uh, within the models that we've looked at in terms of feed and forage saved. In addition to that, you've got a change in lamb price. So typically across that summer period over the last five or six years, lamb prices could easily be falling by 15 or 20 pence per lamb per day over the summer. And you put those together and, and we've put in a nominal figure about 30 pence a lamb for days to slaughter. I could easily make a case for it being higher and I could make it uh, a case for it for the direct benefits to be higher on some systems and the change in land price to be lower and vice versa, depending on your system. But I think we've got a good robust figure there. And we've not taken into account, but you will on your farms, some of the indirect benefits. So there is a labor saving. There isn't much of a labor saving when the first draw goes, but as you get towards the end of the summer and there are big draws that have left the farm that don't need handling and weighing and treating, and, and worrying about as the grass disappears, um, then that has, it has a big impact. Obviously, the longer the lambs are on the farm, the greater the risk of uh, mortality, and also the greater the risk of a check in growth. And again, dwelling on the, the droughts of last year, but that was very much in evident. And of course, the early sale of lamb does free up grass for other things. There is an opportunity cost there. If you want lambs at the end of the season, well, you can finish your lambs and you can potentially buy and store lambs uh, and do other things with those. So there are some indirect benefits that we've not included in, in, in this particular model, but should be considered. So we've got our lamb value. Uh, some very quick charts here, just plotting data for sires. Um, this shows the relationship between carcass weight and lamb value. So quite a strong relationship here. Carcass weight is quite an important part of um, uh, our, our index. Um, confirmation, again, will uh, the lamb value will tend to increase as the confirmation EBVs increase, but it isn't such a strong relationship. Um, as days to slaughter reduces, then again, the overall, we observe that the overall lamb value uh, is increasing. So days to slaughter is clearly having an impact here. Uh, in the way that we rank our sires. And in terms of fat class, has very, very little overall impact. We put a small negative weighting because that's the price that we recognize from the grid um, because of penalties for lambs that are over fat. But having said that, slightly fatter genetics tend to have slightly higher conformation um, and slightly higher carcass weights. So one almost balances against the other. Uh, and so actually it doesn't, when we look at the data, having plugged the, the figures in, it doesn't seem to have a massive impact. So here is a table of the animals from uh, for 2022. Unsurprisingly to see the two rams at the top because they featured so highly for carcass weight and for carcass confirmation. Uh, and sitting third in the list, and I suspect some more on that table if I looked for them, would be some other Charolais from the Shaz Compare project, uh, whereby Andrew and Jamie have been testing both their genetics and, and genetics of their stock rams um, across mules to, to look at their performance, which has really helped to boost our data set. You can see our reference rams sit in there in about eighth or ninth position, uh, but you can see representation from all of the breeds that we're working with. We've got some high performance Suffolks within that list. We've got some high performance meat links, as you would expect and Hampshire's as well. So quite a range within our, our mixed breed um, listing. And interestingly, we've also had a good year for the rams that have been selected because those sitting first, second and third on the list would also sit first, second and fourth on the all time list. If we look at all the rams that we've tested through through Ram Compare. So those are some quite special genetics. But really the next stage is getting the data out there and used. So we've got the lower eye uh, ram from, from Neil Orton here. If you look at his figures now um, online, you'll see the information that was there yesterday. But today we've also got breeding values for days to slaughter, carcass weight, confirmation, uh, fat class, and overall lamb value. 
we can see that this was a high performing ram for muscle depth and particularly for CT traits, lean weight, jigot muscularity. This was a really muscular um, Charolais and we can see that that muscling was turned into weight in the carcass. So that also supports uh, the work that we do on CT scanning and shows the value uh, of that within our genetic evaluations. So that data expressed on a Charolais ba uh, baseline is available for everyone to see. Now we do have a report that you can run uh, if you're a Signet client and you're logged on that will show you all the RAMs within your breed. But I thought the moment I put that on, uh, people will start playing with the website and you'll probably crash it um, if everyone has a go at once and that will be the focus for the questions. So as a little bit of a cheat, um, I have put up a quick PDF while the help of my team onto the Signet website. So you head into the RAM compare area and if you scroll down that, you can see PDFs uh, showing the top RAMs uh, in those breeds ranked according to LAM values. So that's just a disclaimer before I show you how to use the, the online tools uh, to find this information. So that information is up there and posted, but of course that's as of the April run uh, and that will constantly be updated as the season goes on. So to run these reports yourselves, log on to the Signet website. Uh, which you can do if you're your Signet clients. If you go to Breed Summary, then there's a, a sub-menu there with a number of the reports that we can produce, and there are two new ones, one that says Carcass Traits and one that says Carcass Traits Electronic for those that would just like to have that data dropped into an Excel spreadsheet. So they've been developed uh, in recent weeks. You head to that page, you put in the oldest and the youngest RAMs of interest, so at the moment, you probably want to just look at all the RAMs and put in a wide spread of dates. Um, the trait of interest, so we've put LAM value, but you could rank them on confirmation or, or data slaughter if you wished, breed of interest, and then a minimum number of, of progeny records uh, that, that you want to use to, to, to just subfilter the results down. So you can run that and, and produce the data in real time. And this is the sort of thing that you generate. So I'm, I'm following our theme um, at the moment with the Charolais, but run it for any breed. You can see details of the animal, sire and dam, total number of progeny, but also number of abattoir records. So this is a ram with several hundred lambs in the system, most of them pure Charolais. Uh, and then because we would have purchased 30 straws, uh, to test this RAM via AI, you can see the number of abattoir records. And in many cases, we'll have quite big, big numbers there. The more negative the figure for days to slaughter, the faster the finishing. So Hyde Vallegro uh, here is actually, of these four, is the slightly faster finishing of the RAMs. Uh, carcass weight, so the positive value here, uh, meaning that this RAM's got a carcass weight is about a quarter of a kilo higher. Uh, than the one below, which again is, is another very high ranking animal in the breed, confirmation and fat class. And again, negative values would tend to eat, mean slightly leaner progeny. Uh, and these aren't particularly lean rams by any stretch of the imagination. You can see that um, they're very close to sort of average. And then at the end is the overall lamb value. So these top rams here, have a, a progeny value due to their genetics that we predict to be about five pounds a lamb. Um, the way that we've scaled the results for Charolais probably varies between sort of uh, minus five and plus five, so a range of about 10 pounds in terms of progeny value. And that would actually be fairly typical of all the numerically large terminal sires that we've tested, uh, a range of about eight or nine pounds a lamb that you can get simply by shopping around uh, for the best genetics. And if you multiply that up over a RAM's working lifetime, that's a tremendous amount of money. So just a, a small diversion, we'll just talk about Dorsets for a second. Uh, the Dorset breeder is very interested in the project, but they said, well, we've actually got this data. We can supply it to you. And I said, if you get me 2000 records, we'll do something with it. And within 48 hours, I had 1987 or something like that. So very quickly, we were able to get this electronic data and we've been sent it and made good use to it ever since. We've got about six and a half thousand Dorset records in this data set and over 200 
rams already been tested for abattoir traits so that's really exciting information for them particularly when they're talking to the supply chains that they're working with to supply lamb and just a little inkling of of where they're at it's not a surprise to see that these numerically large breeds like the suffolk where we have a a lot of data available to us and only a small subset that we're able to progeny test then the average accuracy is a relatively low value within that there's some very high accuracy animals but the average accuracy value um, as you would expect would is sitting relatively low at this moment in time and yet for the dorsets they've already got an average accuracy if you just looked at the 21 lamb crop of around 30 percent so there's quite a bit of data helping to fuel their their evaluation also helps to answer another question so people often say well how many carcass records do you need to test a ram to, to see if he has a good level of performance these are quite high heritability traits so my sort of benchmark of 25 to 30 lambs per ram would get you accuracies about 75 to 80 percent and actually by the time you get up to about 40 lambs you quickly got accuracies of 85 up to sort of 90 percent so you don't need hundreds of lambs per sire to get them well tested you do need to have that, them in, a, in a, a large flock compared to other rams with a good sort of framework around that data but this is information that we can collect relatively quickly and get some quite good predictions on relatively fast so that tells us a little bit about sort of progeny numbers so just sort of in a, a few closing slides where do we go from here we've got a really good infrastructure for analyzing abattoir data that we've set up using the ram compare as our pilot as our model to do that but in addition to that we're very open to other data and other sources um, whether that's individual farms which may have commercial data or indeed some breed societies that are talking about whether they maybe find a couple of farms themselves where they ask them to single sire mate uh, the ewes and, and collect data back from those so as always more more data is always useful uh, in these projects the second way that you might see accuracies picking up in the future is by fitting correlations so between scan weight and days to slaughter would be the obvious one and if we did that even animals without much abattoir data would start getting more robust predictions of days to slaughter and i think that's something that may come over time we just need to go a couple of seasons and check the stability uh, of the breeding values that come through particularly for something like days to slaughter whereby we actually get a proportion of the lamb crop coming through over the season rather than all the data at once and that may have a little bit of a bearing on how we we publish and handle the data and then of course there's always genomic solutions so signet's going to be producing some of the first genomic breeding values all going well uh, for hill sheep this summer uh, and we're trying to put in uh, a, a system of, of uh, certainly some thoughts about how we would move forward in terms of collaborating uh, and, and moving towards a more genomic future but that's one for a little bit down the line but what we have got is the dna stored for all the rams that that we've had on test or for most of them and that's something that i would encourage people to think about if you're not involved in genotyping is making sure that should you want to you can access those genotypes in the future how can you get involved well you'd expect me to say you can nominate rams so we will do that and bridget will be very grateful to have a conversation with you about that um, it isn't coincidence that the nominations actually close tomorrow after you've had a chance to listen to this presentation uh, and if it isn't natural service rams you're looking to put forwards then you know if you've got semen in the tank it's definitely worth something uh, having a think about uh, where you can read more if you go to the HTB knowledge library you can download our publication on selecting recorded rams um, so you can have a look at that there equally be very happy to put one in the post to you if you send an email through to signet or pick one up from us at, at north sheep and where can you hear more about it well we're delighted to be back out on the road now with covid behind us so heading up to uh, midlothian um, for um, uh, an event with, with qms uh, up at sockland and then we've got events in northumberland and uh, we've got some interesting things going on down in cornwall uh, this year with the rams that have been used um, which i think will be of interest to people 
So that's the end of the formal presentation, I think. It is indeed. So I will stop sharing and see if anybody's still out there. Thanks for that, Sam. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, Bridget's back. So Bridget, have we got many questions coming in? Uh, there's not too many at the moment, um, but we will make a, a start. And if anybody wants to send any other questions in, please do. Um, first question, Sam, what would be the benefits of genomics for these traits? Okay, the, the beauty of genomics is that if you've learned something about one really well phenotyped, one really well recorded population, and there are animals with common genetics, uh, a common DNA background, then you can use the prediction of one to enhance your predictions for, for the other traits. So we know it's expensive to have to run a progeny test, um, but that's a way that we can get greater benefit from it. You invest really heavily in the, in the progeny test, but then you spin out the benefits more widely if you know about the, the information um, and, and, and essentially moving to genomic breeding values. Okay, thank you, Sam. Another question. I have a commercial flock and single sire mate where possible, selling all lambs dead weight. Can I send my data to RamCompare to get EBVs for my tops? Uh, we could certainly have a conversation about it. I always have to be a bit careful not to promise uh, open-ended checks in terms of activity. Uh, we have to think about uh, the, the priorities, and particularly if my, if my boss will be listening in this evening. Um, but we are very interested in, in these data sets. We can have a bit of a chat with you about your data set. Depends a little bit how clean the data is. Uh, some is more is easier to, to access than others. Um, but if you've got strong links in with signet recorded RAMs that have been tested, we'd certainly like to have that conversation. I've already had one of those conversations today, I'm pleased to say. Next question, what does RAM compare contribute to maternal? I guess maternal traits, maternal traits. Yeah, to maternal traits. It's, it is very much a terminal sire test. Um, the comparison with our friends in Sheep Island is they would do matings and they would keep the females back and record their performance uh, as ewes over their lifetime, which t obviously takes quite a while to come through. It takes a while to test a ram for his daughter's performance and they'd pick up the slaughter data as well from the males. We've purely focused on the terminal sire aspects. What we do have is really good maternal evaluations already. Um, we you know, effectively relaunched our lowland maternal evaluation a couple of years ago where Clin and Romney uh, and, and Exlana and Wool Shedding Genetics and Rusan all go into one pot. And from that, we have really good, really robust breeding values for genetics for milk production, prolificacy, lamb survival, ewe longevity, some really good work on worm resistance. Uh, we're looking at ewe mature weight and body condition score, so we can really focus on the efficiency of, of these ewes. So in many ways, our effort and resource has been on been focused on making that analysis as good as we possibly can rather than diluting our effort and doing a bit of progeny testing on the side the only thing i would say is that the way that we've learned how to analyze abattoir data we've applied to the maternal model so quite a few clin breeders are killing lots of males in the same way that the, the pole dorset breeders are and we take that data and that data is analysed and actually only this week Samir updated the parameters based on the, the latest SIUC findings for that. So what's it done for maternal breeds? It's helped create exactly the same infrastructure for analysing that data and we can take that data from breeders but we don't run it as a separate maternal progeny test. Okay, thank you. Um, Next question, at the moment EBVs are breed specific or within breed, will performance recording ever be assessed regardless of breed? It's, we're assessing them regardless of breed, but then we're expressing them on a breed specific base. So when the data goes in, we do analyze, we take into account hybrid vigor, we take into account um, breed as part of that. 
So actually the first set of results that come out are on a level playing field, and then an additional step is put in place to then convert them back and express them onto a, a specific base. Um, and, and that's how we present them to industry. Um, and that was very much a first step. There's a bit of logic for doing that rather than having one breed beating another over the head because they've got figures three kilos heavier or uh, two millimeter more. That was the sort of approach. And to be honest, in the early days of the mixed breed analysis, me to say one breed's three kilos heavier than another one uh, and for everyone to go to war over it when we didn't have the commercial data sets that we have through RAM Compare um, would, would have been on a hiding to nothing. Because we've got this infrastructure in place, it does mean in the future, we may move to something that is uh, you know, operating without that those differences. And interestingly, in our maternal evaluation, because so many clin and wool shedding breeds shuffle in and out of each other's populations, we actually don't do the rebasing for, for that breed. So, but I would still say to people, your best comparison is within breed. Uh, you know, even in that analysis, compare your clins with other clins. First of all, compare your clin with, sorry, there's no plural of clins, compare your clin with other <laughs> clin sheep um, and do that within the groups that are working together, like PRLB, uh, where there are genetics being changed. The link between that animal uh, and, uh, for example, a Rusan that, that's unconnected won't be particularly strong at this moment in time. But that doesn't mean the analysis doesn't work and do a good job when you're out there shopping for Clin or shopping for Rusan. Okay, thank you. Where are we at with regard meat eating quality? We, good question. Uh, we did some initial work at the start of the project whereby we took shear force measurements on about three and a half thousand, four thousand lambs, which is a big data set in the word of shear force, uh, particularly for those of us. I only did one batch, but that had to cut the meat into small rectangles according to the grain of the tissue. And, uh, and Siobhan and Andrew and Stuart gave us a lot of help doing that. So we collected those measurements. We analysed it, we looked at the heritabilities, we produced breeding values, and those were published last year as the sort of the, the, the finale of that bit of the project. The challenge is that that's really expensive. So we did it to understand the genetics, to see if there was a genetic component. And because the beauty is that we do have DNA from both the lambs and the sires, so that may inform genomic predictions in the future. But at the moment, there isn't the funding in place to continue collecting shear force in that way. One of the other reasons that we did that was to see if there were any strong relationships with other traits. Were we selecting against, and I'm going to specifically say shear force and tenderness as opposed to meat eating quality, which can actually conjure up all sorts of other aspects of consumer acceptability, but to see if there are any other negative attributes out there. And nothing major jumped out in my sort of you know very quick look at the data but there's a data set there waiting for geneticists to have a look at and that's probably something we'd come back to if we we have a more genomic future or indeed if other shear force uh, phenotypes become available they can they can be slotted in you know that's not a problem but at the moment we don't have the funding to to collect additional um, uh, shear force. And that's a little bit the same with the primals as well, Bridget. That was very much a, a phase one project. Uh, and then as we've sort of widened what we've done, um, we've not continued to collect those phenotypes. Thank you for that, Sam. Um, is there any information within RAM Compare to suggest that a particular RAM breed knits better with a particular maternal breed than another? <laughs> bit controversial. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think there's any evidence to show that. You could ask whether we've looked or asked the right questions, but I don't think there's particular evidence uh, of that in the background. Obviously, some of our maternal breeds will have a frequency of myostatin gene kicking about and others won't. Uh, and I can understand how that may um, uh, have an impact 
when those sheep are mated with some terminal sires that may have a myostatin gene and some that won't. I, think, I guess that's as close as, as, as I would get to that. I think we need to remember it's really a comparison of the rams um, because you breed is very much compounded with flock. So each of the flocks tends to have a different ewe breed and equally has a different system. So I might see a marvellous crop of lambs on a particular farm. I'm sure I see a marvellous crop of lambs on every farm, but I might see a marvellous crop of lambs on a particular farm. And yet I still can't tease out whether that's due to the genetics of the, the ewes that we're working with or whether it's due to the farm and the forage and the system. And in reality, it doesn't matter to me because all I want is these rams to have a fair crack of the whip on that particular farm and to effectively have, have, have been treated exactly the same or their progeny to be the same. Thank you, Sam. Can you comment on connectedness reporting and how good it is within and be between breeds and how much RAM compare is affecting this? Gosh, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> you on your toes. <laughs> you'll have to tell me afterwards who sent that one in. Um, <laughs> At the moment, we can't. Um, Mike's currently supporting us, uh, basically updating the connectedness software um, to deal with these big data sets. He's made quite a bit of, of headway with that, and we look forward to having a look at the results. The gut feel is that connectedness between sheep flocks won't be particularly strong. And that's because we know in the previous days of sire reference schemes, where people were using semen from an individual ram and using it between the flocks, we, we still know that we had flocks that would have had lower levels of connectedness than you might want in terms of our ability to compare. And we sort of live with that to an extent. There is ram sharing and swapping and all sorts of things that create linkage, but it isn't as strong as a, as a formal reference scheme. I think what's interesting, and I'm digressing not for the first time tonight, um, but is considering a genomic future because I think that will give us a better handle of closeness of relationships between flocks at a, a genetic level, which is what connectedness is trying to do. So in our hill sheep breeding program, the pedigrees don't tend to be very deep and the level of rams swapping and exchanging and use of semen is very, very low. But we hold genotypes for these Welsh mountains. And that means that we can actually look at the, the closeness of relationships between flocks at a genomic level. And that might well solve something that we've wrestled with for two decades as a challenge. And I think the opportunity for genomics to deal with comparing flocks and flock differences is as great as many of the other advantages of, of that technology. Well done, Sam. <laughs> um, just a couple of extra questions. Um, with the monthly analysis, now with RAM Compare moving to a monthly analysis, will the EBVs change a lot over the year or will there be certain times of the year where we might see them jump? I, I think that's a fair comment. Um, and there's a slight unknown there. For fast finishing farms that send in big amounts of data, um, for new rams, I think they'll be relatively stable because effectively you'll get 300 lambs, 250 lambs, bang, the, the data will all be in um, and, and that will be fine. I think for flocks that are drawing lambs over a longer period, we learn a little bit early on and the system might be quite risk averse. And then as the season goes on, we are, might identify that actually some of those early lambs um, you know, by a particular sire, um, you know, they will look even better once we get data in from, let's say, some of the slower finishing sires later in the season. And so figures may start to move a little bit away from the average. And I guess that will happen to both the very good ones might start looking better and the poorer ones might start looking worse as, as more data comes in. And I think that's something that's a little bit unique to today's to slaughter um, in particular. If you compare it with ultrasound scanning, you know, Stuart uh, will turn up and scan your flock and he'll do everything on one day and the data goes in, in one hit. And the animals then in the next analysis sit where they sit and they rank and um, generally speaking will stay there. But with the measurements for days to slaughter, they are going to come in in, you know, in dribs and drabs over the season. And uh, it's something that, that we'll look at. 
I mean, we could delay publication. We could say, well, we don't publish any EBVs until, you know, six months down the line when all the data's in. But then you've lost that advantage of fast turnaround for those those farms that are finishing lambs really, really quickly. So, yeah, it's one that we're going to watch, which is partly why they're standalone at, at the moment, Bridget, so that we can do just that. Okay, thank you. And final question, I think, unless anybody else has any burning questions, they need to put them in quickly. Um, and just as she says that, here's a new one. Um, I'll do this one first. Um, ac accuracy values, are they good for carcass traits? They seem around 30% seems a little low. Um, yes, and maybe I'd, I'd, I confuse the, the, the situation with that particular chart. So, they are good for animals that are measured they're good for and you'll say well that's no good because those animals are dead so <laughs> fair enough or the brothers and sisters of those animals that are still alive and very much so for the fathers of those animals that have been tested so because the heritability is high we can get quite high accuracy figures the reasons those average accuracy figures were low is because they encompassed vast numbers of animals with no measurements and phenotypes uh, contributing towards the evaluation um, and, and so maybe it was a little bit misleading but it was just to show the contrast that you know Dorsets have the same scenario they're certainly not slaughtering all of their lambs we've got some flocks with no abattoir data coming in and yet we're already seeing that, that, that you know we've got a significant amount of data there so for flocks that are engaged we can get quite quite high accuracy figures um and uh, yeah there's probably a little bit more work to be done there to see what level of accuracy we can get for let's say charlie rams going to the premier sale bearing in mind that there'll be young animals without abattoir records of their own or of their progeny so it'll be purely related to dad's performance and maybe some brothers and that would be another classic example where genomics would be really helpful because you get a higher accuracy on a young animal faster so that you can make a good decision on that okay two more questions and then i think we'll close how have the correlations of the ct traits and ultrasound scanning to the carcass traits changed over the project how correlations of ct traits and ultrasound scanning to carcass traits changed over the project yeah we don't have any fitted in the analysis at this moment in time just because we wanted to see where the abattoir traits sit and we didn't want for example days to slaughter EBV at the moment being pulled about by the other weight weight measurements so we haven't changed the relationships between the CT and ultrasound traits that we had and the relationships between those and each other and there are none fitted between the CT or the ultrasound traits and our abattoir data um, People might remember that sometimes I've pulled the data off and said, well, you know, this is muscle depth and this is carcass confirmation in a very crude Excel spreadsheet type way for animals with lots of records. Do we see a relationship? What sort of relationship do we see? Um, and that's sort of, you know, that's been a fairly constant picture over time. We can find a nice relationship between the traits, but it isn't one. If it was one, we don't need RAM compare. We just go out and ultrasound sheep and all is well. And it isn't one, it tends to be 0.3s, 0.4s. So it's heading us in the right direction, but abattoir data would take us there faster. CT data would, would take us there faster as well. I'm not sure if this is a question or more of a comment. Geographically farms across, <laughs> across GB, Great Britain, grow more grass, e.g. West has an impact on performance. <laughs> not sure if you want to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> well. If you've got grass, lambs will grow. <laughs> I, I, think, I think last year, not too many people were arguing about how much grass they had. I went to some fairly bare places all, all over the, the country. So you're right, there's a um, differences as you move between the farms. And from a genetic analysis point of view, you know, as long as all the lambs are treated the same, we can handle that. I think it's probably fair to say that the importance of the traits does, however, vary. 
if you know you've got a farm where it is going to dry up fast, where stocking density is greatly reduced later in the autumn, then days to slaughter becomes even more valuable to you. Whereas if you know that you've got lots of grass going into the summer and the autumn and there's much less pressure there, then it has arguably a lower value and you can concentrate on some of those those other traits. So, you know, that that's moving a little closer to thinking about the right EBVs for a given production system. And that's recognising that the systems vary. But I, I still think they get a, a fair crack of the whip across our various farms. You may have answered this in the previous question, Sam. Final one, is there a direct correlation between land value EBV and, well, land value index and lean meat yield EBV? And lean meat yield EBV, mm. there will be um, because carcass weight is a strong component of land value. And one of the things that will be influencing carcass weight will be the CT lean weight which I, I guess is the bit that I'm calling uh, lean uh, you know, yield EBV. Carcass weight is one of the most challenging of the traits to enhance, simply because it's influenced by lots of things. It is influenced by growth, but it's not all about growth. So high scan weight sheep don't always give high carcass weight EBVs. And it is influenced by muscling traits, but it isn't purely about muscling traits. And actually, you know, the CT prediction of, of lean weight, particularly on a weight adjusted basis, is one of the best predictions that we have. We're just a little bit limited sometimes in the amount of CT to the data that we've got behind that. But the beauty of CT is you can also get your jigot shape from that. And that is closely linked to um, confirmation. That probably is no surprise to anybody. Fantastic. Thank you, Sam. Um, just to, just to, that's the end of the questions. You can relax. Um, just a little reminder, because a couple of people have um, added their rows and numbers in for their CPD points. So please, if you haven't done that already, as Bryony asked, um, if you just pop it into the chat, then we can pick those up and make sure that you get your CPD points. Um, so I will say thank you, Sam, for the questions. And uh, I guess we hand back to Bryony, do we? <laughs> But well, we can do if she is still about in the background. <laughs> I'm she'll still probably here. just say good night. Yeah, no, thank you both. Thanks, Sam. Brilliant presentation and loads of really great questions. So yeah, just to reiterate, CPD points, put them in the question box. Um, if anybody's got any other questions, please put them on the feedback form and we'll send them to Sam uh, and Bridget and they can respond or alternatively get in touch with them. Their details will be on the Signet and the HDB website. So um, thank you all for your attention. We'll finish there for tonight and we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.